Hi everyone, I'm Bohush Blahut and welcome to Catalyzer. You, ImageFX and your Amiga have the power to create great special effects, but you might not know it yet. So we're here to be your catalyst. We'll show you the might of ImageFX and help you kickstart the creative energies that you already have. We've enclosed a floppy disk with the project files and images that I'll be using throughout the tape. So let's roll up our sleeves, pull up your VCR and your Amiga, and let's get started. Image effects is the Your Amiga's tank is full of This video is the What you've just seen is the introduction to the Amiga video magazine called Legacy. Now what we did there is we used ImageFX's ability to do regionalized processing. Now what the regions allow you to do is just select parts of a picture to apply a special effect, a color, a texture, whatever. And not only did we use the regions, we did that on many frames as you saw. And we do that through using macro recording and auto effects. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. First of all, let's explore what the regions can do for you, and then we'll go into how to record a macro and use them in auto effects. Join me now on the interface, would you? So here's our control panel. And if, you, if you're familiar with image effects, you've worked with this before. But let's take a quick review, if we may. Now, depending on what display device you're using, we're using an IV24 in 12-bit mode. Uh, we can use the right mouse button to make the, make the panel disappear and reappear. And we'll be using this a lot, so you'll see the interface vanishing, not to worry. Let's load up our first picture, and this is located on your floppy disk. an old picture of a lady off of a CD-ROM that I got in Prague. I hope you like it. So, looking in the top corner here, in the top left-hand corner, you'll see the word full, and what that's telling you is any operation that you undertake is going to happen to the whole image. Now, if I double-click in the center, we can get a good look at the region operations box, and you'll see down the side that there's a row and this lets you choose what kind of region you're going to have and also what, what painting tool you're going to use to create it. Like you can stretch out a box, an oval, a polygon, etc. There's an option to allow painting. Uh, we're not going to use that right now. But there's these options to load and save regions that if you've got some kind of specific outline that you've made, you can load and save it from disk. Inverting the region is also quite handy where let's say you've spent a lot of time intricately tracing a shape you know and it's in the center of the screen well once you're done doing processing to that shape you can just hit invert region and it'll select everything else and leave your original stuff alone let's pick box for right now now we'll reproduce the look we had on the legacy maker excuse me the legacy intro and that was just a lot of boxes of color all over the place and some textures. So I'm going to stretch out a box here on the left hand side and you'll see the little marching ants. And anything we do will just happen in this box. So I want to make it a pretty bright color. 
So the first thing I'm going to do is go into the color menu and hit color to gray. That'll change that part of the screen to black and white. The reason why is if we're going to be adding these colors, it'll be much more distinctive. The color will pop more if it starts on top of a, of a gray background. So let's make this kind of a, a shiny, happy blue. There we go. Now, it's, it's, uh, it could use a little spicing up. So let's go into Effect, Apply Texture, and we'll load up a texture from the included textures with Image Effects. Honeycomb looks pretty cool. Now the texture depth, you'll notice, uh, that, that shows how deep this texture is being like carved into the picture. And then you can have it be shiny, meaning that it'll have specular highlights. And also uh, shading, that seems to kind of darken the picture overall, but sometimes it's pretty cool. You can also create these textures yourself by making just a small 256 color gray picture of something that repeats or tiles. But like I say, we're using something bundled with image effects. And we'll keep the light in its default setting. And let's hit OK. So we've got this cool honeycomb pattern. Maybe you could create a title that goes up the side or a, or a cast name or something like that. So now using our box tool, we're going to pick another region. So I'm going to pick the one, the rest of the screen pretty much, like so. And now the marching ants go around the rest of the screen. And we still have box selected. Now I'm going to double click in the middle and I'm going to go back to full for a moment. I'm going to clip out a brush. Now what the brush is, you, you click on the scissors tool and you can use any of these shapes to pick up a portion of the image and then paste it down as many times as you want throughout the rest of the image. We're just going to use a simple square. And we're just taking it around, we're taking a, a clip of the face. And as you can see, I'm moving it around. And depending on your display card, it'll display differently on your machine. But let's go back to full, I, I should say, let's go back to box. You know, there it is. Though the brush is still there, you know, it's just kind of sitting in the background someplace. Well, let's color this. So let's make this kind of a, kind of a pinkish, purplish red. I'm dropping the green down to make the, the color even more extreme. There it goes. Now mind you, if this is destined for video, you have to be very careful that your colors don't get too hot. And you can hit this video filter, and then it'll knock down everything to legal video limits. Right now, of course, it's acting on our one region, because I could see this being trouble later. So now that we've got this, let's, uh, let's go into another effect. We'll go into Crystallize. And this is to just kind of randomize the background here so that we're not going to see this woman's portrait so much. We'll see kind of her, it'll look like her shape being seen through a faceted piece of glass. Which I think is kind of cool. So now that that's done, Let's go back to our brush. Now you'll note that I've gone back to the region, the region screen. It's because the brush is a type of region. We'll be exploring this in the, next, uh, in the next tutorial. But here's our brush again. And what I'm interested in doing is making it a little bigger than its original size. So I go into Size, Scale, and I want to scale it up maybe 10% maybe larger than it is right now. So I'm going to click on this to say lock to the image's aspect, meaning that as I stretch it in one direction, it'll stretch it the other way at the same rate, so it won't get all distorted and stuff. So we'll tell it that we want to go 110%, 100 being its original size, of course, 10% adding on top of it. And you'll notice I, I only filled in this box, and it correctly filled in these two guys for how big, the pixel, uh, how big it should be in pixels. Hit OK. So we have a slightly enlarged brush than what's behind it. So it's almost like we're seeing this magnified panel. But I'd like to make a drop shadow for it before I paste it down. So what I did is I double clicked on one of the painting tools. 
And this is where we get options for the tools. So the topmost one, this is, uh, this is the mode that we're going to draw in. And we're going to darken. What darken does is it, it will darken whatever is behind the brush in the shape of the brush. Now in our case, that's a square. So it's just going to make a dark square. We can also tell it that we want to feather the edge in. This means it'll soften, you know, it'll soften the edges around it so that it won't be really, you know, abrupt and computer graphics looking. It'll look a little more natural. So let's find a, a nice place to put that. There we go. So that's our drop shadow. Double click again on the drawing tool. Go into normal. I'm going to turn the feathering off. And you know what? I'm going to gamma correct it just a little bit. Gamma is a nice way to brighten a picture without ruining the contrast. Because oftentimes if you crank the contrast too much, you'll get kind of this washed out image that nobody wants to look at. So gamma between 50 and 60 seems to be the magic number. So there we go. And hit the period key to let go of the brush. And this is our image. Now, as a still, you know, you could do something cool with this. But it's coolest in front of moving video. Especially when you consider, you know, we've got this faceted background. So as your subject is moving, you're going to see all these facets moving in a neat way. Again, like you're looking through a window. And then you're going to have this magnified portion. And it'll, it'll resemble a lot, a lot of intro sequences from things like talk shows, uh, commercials, things like that. But how do you apply it to more than one image? Well, image effects makes it really easy. And this is where we talk about recording a macro. Using macros lets you perform a series of steps in image effects and then repeat those actions later on another image by just calling on the macro. To create a macro, you record one while you do your work the first time and then the computer creates a macro file that you can use later. The file you record is just a text file and it contains an AREX script. And pretty much all you need to know is a few keyboard shortcuts to create this little text file. And image effects takes most of the work takes over most of the work for you. Let's go back to the panel for a second. The shortcut you need to know, well first let's load up a fresh version of our picture. So I'm going back to the catalyzer floppy disk to load this up. Okay, there she is. The first thing I do is I hit the shift key and the number one. And I get this requester. And it's saying select learn file at the top of the requester. As I said earlier, the macro is a text file. And this gets saved onto disk. So where does it go? Well, it has to sit on the hard drive someplace. Now the best place for you to put it, and I'm going to scroll down here, is into the directory marked Auto Effects. Auto Effects is the program we're going to be using very shortly. And Auto Effects really likes it if all of the macros that you create live in the Auto Effects directory. So click on it once to select. And let's call this uh, legacy color. And uh, try to avoid using spaces. You know, I used an underscore here, just so the file name is, is one long string. Now it's asking if, one, if we want to record the current draw settings. Now we don't really need to do this in this particular instance. Uh, the macro is going to record every button you hit, every slider you adjust, every parameter you change. Now we're going to be you know, changing the drawing settings a bunch. But if you're creating a macro where you need the drawing settings to be set up at the beginning, then you would select yes for this requester. But for what we're doing, we can just say no. All right, so we're just going to click on no. And all we do is do exactly the same as what we did before. Just go through and do your work, and the macro will capture all of it. So follow along with me as I do this kind of quickly. So the box tool, stretch this guy out, color to gray, go into the balance menu, oops, take the red back, pop up the blue. So to end the macro, 
to end the recording, this is where you hit Shift 2. Now the thing to remember as well, and the interface just says that the, it lets you know that the recording is stopped. What's important to remember, like I said, everything you do, every button you click is going to get recorded into that macro. That also includes if you select an effect, apply it, and then hit undo. It's going to, you know, every time it loads up a frame and performs the macro, it's going to do the effect and then undo it, which is a waste of time. But we'll be learning how to edit a macro file shortly. So all you'd have to do is go in and just delete those lines, you know, if that's something you didn't want to do. Let me show you how to apply the macro here from Image Effects, how you can test it before you go gallivanting off and applying it to multiple thousands of frames. Let's again load up a fresh version of the picture. Down here in the lower right, there's a button marked Arex. Click on it and you'll get a requester and you'll note that it's the same list of image effects macros that you just recorded to. So let's go into Auto Effects and find the one called Legacy Color. And notice that it's doing all the work. I'm just sitting around. And this is the exact same process that Image Effects will follow while it's constructing your picture. And this is what Auto Effects is for. It's pretty much kind of a file management program where you specify a list of files. Then you have a, uh, an area where you can select scripts to execute to each, each file in that list. And then it just goes through and performs these macros. Let's go back and you'll see that the Amiga is done. You know, it created this without my intervention at all. So now let's take a look at how you'd apply this to multiple frames. Now I'm going to go back to the workbench and I'd like to show you what the macro file looks like. I'm going to go back by using the left Amiga M combination. And let's open up a, a shell. Oops. And what I'm going to do is we're going to go into the image effects directory and let's uh, let's have it you know we'll go add legacy color dot ifx and let's take a look at what the macro recording looks like so again we're looking at this in a just the Amiga's regular text editor you could use a word processor or something just so long as you save out an ASCII file and as you go down, you can actually kind of read this. You know, you can see first there was a region, you know, which was that region on the left, then the color to gray, and then the red, green, and blue adjustments we made, and the texture, all the way down to doing the crystallize and stamping down the brush. So as you can see, it's just a regular old text file, and these are the kind of things that we're going to be modifying later. Now here on the workbench, I have an icon marked Auto Effects. Let's double click. Now this will load up another copy of image effects. So if you have uh, if you have a, a nice amount of RAM, you know, 16 megs or so, you should be okay running two versions at the same time. And this is what Auto Effects looks like. And as I said, it mostly resembles a, a file management program. Okay. Let's take a close look. Just take a tour of the Auto Effects interface. Over on the left, you'll notice we have an area where you select files. This is how you navigate through all of your hard drives and come up with your lists that you will then add to your auto effects lift, list, which is in the upper right corner. These are the files that will get processed. Now these can be, uh, these can be sequential files like uh, a sequence that you've rendered or something from a, a VLAB motion or a, uh, or a PAR card, for example, or it can just be the contents of a directory. Like you could use this to batch convert you know, an, an entire directory of pictures or frame stores, let's say, to JPEG. Then you've got the bottom right, and that's where your operations are listed, where you've got all of the macros you're going to perform. And you don't just need to perform one. You can perform as many as you like. And you'll note that in the, top, in the top, it already says load. Okay, so it's ready to go pretty much. So first of all, let's, let's find a bunch of images that we'd like to colorize. Okay. I'm going to go to the floppy drive. 
and I actually have a small image sequence located there. I've got a number of JPEGs of clouds here. So in order to select them, just go down and highlight. So I'll just make it these 30. And I hit Add Files here. And then that gets added to my list. And you could go, like I say, just adding as many as you like. So these are what are going to get affected. Note down here you can choose between the main buffer, the swap, the alpha channel, things like that. So you can actually have several lists running at once. Main and swap and alpha, that's more for when you're doing multi-image compositing, which we'll cover another time. So let's, let's set up our sequence here. Let's set up our list of commands that we're going to issue. I hit Add Command, and this by default will take us into the Auto Effects directory. There's Legacy Color, and you notice it pops up right in that list. I hit Add Command again because we need to save these once we're done, right? So look for Save Buffer as ILBM, which is the default Amiga picture format. All that's left to do is hit Begin. Now what it's asking you for is where should it save these. You can hit this little file folder next to the requester and just select a place to save. So I'm going to select it onto the drive I have called Catalyzer. You, you might want to put it in a subdirectory of some kind, like so. Now this next field is of, of some interest. As, uh, as frames get passed through auto effects, they don't really get a new name. The best you can do is using this little requester, you can add a suffix to it. You can add an extension if you like. Now usually when you have a sequence, you just want it to end in a number. So more often than not, I just erase all of that, and I just rename it later in directory opus. But if you wanted to make sure that you remember that these were your new files, you know, you could put, you know, dot new or dot color, and you can also add a, a, an asterisk to tack on again, you know, the, the current frame number and stuff. But more often than not, I just leave it open. I guess this would be more for if you were creating uh, like I said, if you were converting frame stores to JPEGs or something like that, and you wanted, to have them a new, you wanted them to have a new name, you might put .jpeg at the end. But for us, we just leave it be. And hit OK. And there she goes. The image effects interface that's sitting on our workbench right now, that'll load up the images, and you can kind of follow the progress along. And in the, in the auto effects top bar there, you can see it's on frame 1 of 30, and this will continue to progress. And you can go have lunch or something. And when you come back, you'll have something that looks like this. Well, now that we've looked at regionalized processing, you can see where there's lots of cool effects that you, cr you can create onto video just using simple macro recording. Anything that's like a a static effect, something that doesn't move, is really kind of a piece of cake using macro recording. But there's another type of region. It's, it's the brush. We were using it earlier. And we can create some really cool effects with text. And that's what we're going to show you right now. You've probably noticed that there's a renewed interest in treating text. In, I've seen it in print ads, film, movie credits, uh, TV, and the web. Now, some people are unhappy with how the Amiga treats text. Uh, its font engine might not be everything you expect it to be. However, making cool text really doesn't stop with choosing a cool font. With image effects, we can create lots of cool treatments. And the reason why is once you create text in image effects, it's a brush. And that brush is a region, right? That means whatever effects you choose to create are going to adhere to the inside of that brush. So we can make stuff look really dimensional, really 3D. Follow along as I do some of these examples. Well, the first thing we need is some text to treat. So let hit, let's hit the ABC key over here. This is what gives us the image effects text generator. Let's take a quick look around here. Now, you'll note I already have some text in the text window. In the upper right, that's where you enter things. And remember to hit enter after each line of text, otherwise it won't keep them. 
In the middle part of the screen here, you'll note that there are all kinds of controls for emboldening the text, italicizing, uh, left and right, justifying, etc. Uh, I use the justification stuff often enough, but as far as bold and italic and things like that, oftentimes fonts already come with different versions that are bold and italic, etc. So I often don't use these. Although I'd like you to also note that loading and saving text is very cool in that you can take any ASCII file, like let's say the end of the script for the credit roll that you need that has all the names on it, you could simply load that in as an ASCII text file and it'll pop up in this window. And I've chosen a very heavy font here, something that has a lot of really thick lines to it, and that'll help our effect show up much better. And it knows, also notice that's about 150 pixels high. Well, it's actually exactly 150 pixels high. Uh, that's there to give us lots of room to move around. Let's hit OK. And here's our brush. Note that in the upper left-hand corner of the interface, it says brush now which tells us that anything that we do is going to take place all within the borders of the brush. Now you'll note that the, the brush has kind of this minty color and that's the IV24 way of displaying this text. But if I stamp it down temporarily, you'll see that it's white because we generated it in, in white as you see that's the highlighted color. So I'm going to hit U to undo just to take away this temporary stamp down of the word legacy. So in this project let's make this text really dimensional looking. So to do that, a shortcut would be to use relief mapping. So that's in the Convolve menu. Hit Convolve and Relief Map. And I'm just going to use its default values. It changes the text into gray tones, but it gives it highlights and shadows. As you can kind of see, it could be a little thicker though. But instead of thickening it, let me hit Undo to take away this temporary stamping down. We can blur it and we can do that in the Convolve menu. And here's Gaussian. This slider uh, lets you control how big of a matrix that you use, and the bigger it is, the longer it's going to take for your computer to generate it. So let's go with a 7 by 7 matrix, actually kind of the low end as far as that goes, and hit OK. And that'll just blur our brush. There we go. And I'll stamp it down again so you can take a look at it. So you can see it's standing up a bit off of the, uh, off of the image. Let's hit U to undo again. Now I'd like to customize the color of it instead of sticking to relief mapping's default of kind of gray and white and black. We do that by hitting color and we could use any of these custom uh, color effects in there. But we're going to hit the custom box and we'll load up a new mode we'll use Chrome 3. And you can see we've got these little control points to control how the, how the color gets changed. I'll hit OK. And what that's going to do, and let me stamp it down for you, is it adds these kind of chrome edges on the sides, which I think are pretty hip. Now even you may recognize this from the tutorial section of the back of your image effects manual. There are a number of examples there of how to do all kinds of text tricks. Uh, we've also included a, an AREC script, which you get to by clicking on this button in the lower right hand corner. It's called Text Effects. And the author has taken all of the examples in the image effects manual, and we'll double click in the middle there to open up our options. And he's made them just very easy point and click kind of items. So let's, let's go with hammered gold. I'll double click on that and hit OK. And again, we get our, our text generator. Let's, uh, let's actually write the word gold here. And remember to hit return. And keep the font uh, pretty big. You know, we'll stick with our 150 that we used. But the bigger the better as far as this, this treatment goes. We click on OK, it's just saying that it's done and it's ready for us to actually stamp down the text somewhere. So let's put it right there. And there's our gold colored text. As you can see, it's got a little bit of texture in it that comes from the, the apply texture window that we used earlier. But remember, 
don't limit yourself to just the examples that are in the back of the manual, nor the ones that are a part of the Eric script that we included. Here's a screen full of some treatments that we did to all kinds of text. And remember, you can use pretty much any process available through ImageFX and apply it just to the insides of text. And once you've created something that you like, you can macro record it and share it with other ImageFX users. What we're looking at is the animation created in ImageFX. Now you might be asking yourself, how is it that we've used ImageFX, which is commonly used for stills, to create an animation? Well, we did it through the facility of IMP, and we've used macro recording again. We had to rewrite the macro a little bit in a text editor, but you'll see how easy that is in just a few moments. Let's take a look. First, let's start by loading up the lady. Yes, we're using the lady again. And the effect we had, it was a swirl that animated over time, that changed over time. So let's click on Distort Swirl. And you'll see that I, uh, that I made the swirl kind of small, so that it would just be around her face. And then the, the, the point of origin is right there in the middle, right on her nose. And we had it turning, you know, f we had it, uh, turning from 40 degrees to negative 40 degrees. And then we ping-ponged it back and forth to make the animation look cool. So how do we make it do this? You know, how, do we, how do we animate this, make it automatic? It's surprisingly simple. First of all, we need to create the swirl and macro record it. So let's hit Shift-1. And then we'll create a file called swirl macro. .ifx. Now all we do is go back into distort, swirl, and then we create our mac then we create our swirl, putting 40 in the angle requester. Now what's important is when we're doing this, you have to make sure that this number that you're going to be replacing, this is going to become a variable that's going to be changing over time. You have to make sure that it's distinctive, because when we read the macro later as a text file, you know, if there's another 40 in here, you know, it might be confusing to find out which one is which. But as you can see, there's no other 40 anywhere in here. I clicked stretch and anti-alias. Let's hit OK. OK, so there's our effect. So hit Shift 2 to close off the macro recording. So let's flip over to the workbench to take a look at it. Okay, so here it is. Now the top part, you know, this is the part that ImageFX just puts in there automatically. And this is part of AREX, so don't touch that. Then you've got options results, hook, swirl, 40, and a bunch of zeros. You know, and we've seen this before. So first let's trim off all those, all those zeros. Now what we're going to be doing is we're going to be putting in another line of, another couple lines of text. We're going to be putting parse arg right after the options results line. And it's going to be parse arg followed by some variable. We'll use the letter x. Then in the script itself, we're going to go hook swirl, and then the 40 that's there, that first 40, we're going to change that to an x. So let's punch that up here for you. And you'll note that the parse arg x is right where I said under options results. And then the, where the 40 was before, We've got an X there as well. What's going to happen is we're going to use imp, and it's going to feed numbers. You know, it's going to feed this variable, and that's going to change over the course of the frames that we create. So we're almost ready to plug this into imp. We're actually almost ready to create the animation. Now, we're creating a 30-frame animation, which means we need to start with 30 frames. Now, the disk that you received with this video cassette, it has the one image of the lady on it. So we need to create 30 identical copies for imp to be able to load. Fortunately, this is easy as well. First, you need to clear off a bunch of hard drive space, and then go to Auto Effects. So from Image Effects, I go into Hook, Auto Effects. And now on the left where our files are, I'm going to click 
just once on the, on the lady picture. Then go into Add Command, and the command we're interested in is called Rename One for Sequence. This is included with ImageFX 2.6. What this does is it takes a single picture and it'll make as many copies of it as you like on your hard drive. So let's just hit begin. And it's just telling us it's going to load over the picture we already created. And now it's asking where do we want to save these images. So I'm just going to save it into the root directory of my catalyzer drive and just call it lady dot. And then you don't put any numbers on there because auto effects will tack that on for you. So just hit return and now it's asking how many frames. Well, we've established that the project is 30 frames long. So we just hit 30, and we just wait a few moments, and we'll have copies. So now we're back in Auto Effects. It's finished, and it's created 30 identical copies. And they're named. Let's take a look at them, in fact. Oh, here they are. Lady.0001, all the way up to 30. Great. That's exactly what we needed. So I'm going to hit left Amiga M to go back to image effects. Hit the hook button and launch IMP. Now in many ways, IMP is very similar to auto effects. Uh, the main difference being that it's easier to get variables to animate, like what we're doing here. And also, uh, it's re it, you're required to have all of your images in a row, sequentially numbered, whereas auto effects, you can just pick stuff willy-nilly. This is specifically for creating these types of animated effects and for other batch processing stuff. So this top, this top window is what we're interested in. It's main. So hit pick and just find the files that we're going to need. What we're interested in is, there it is, lady. Now what's important is that you take the number off. You delete the actual numbers, leaving only the period. This is this will be a clue to IMP to load these up one at a time. Swap and alpha we don't use. We only use the last one, destination. This is, of course, where these things are going to be written onto your hard drive, where they're going to save. So I'll hit pick again, which will give me a regular kind of requester. And let's see, I'm going to put it in a directory called RF for rendered frames. I'm going to call this uh, lady underscore swirl dot and leave it alone. I won't put a number on it at all. Now we're creating a 30 frame animation, so we start with 1 and end with 30. That's fine. Then there's this box that asks you, do you want to skip any frames? You know, this is saying by ones, meaning that it'll do every frame. But if you're doing tests, uh, you might want to go every three, every five. You know, something to, so that the rendering doesn't take so long. Now you need to decide what the end result will be. By default, uh, IMP wants to save an animation, just a regular Amiga format, Anim or Anim 7. You can also save out a 24-bit animation, which is more like your flyer or your par type thing. Then you've got 24-bit frames, and this is for loading into maybe a Draco or a VLAB or a Broadcast or Elite, something of that accord. Let's stick with uh, render animation, like so. Now, we need to set a couple options because there are several anim-type formats, and these are covered in uh, section 9.9 .9 of the ImageFX manual, but the online help is actually much more informative, and you get that just by hitting the help key. But let's go up here and set our animation format. So we go Save Format, and we'll say Anim. And then there's an option called Keep for regular anims. If you wanted to just say, if you wanted to save an Anim 7, if you have an AGA machine, then you need to make this Anim 7, and then you don't need any of the options. And this will save a regular old animation that will play out of Mostra, VT, whatever you've got. If you're creating an anim, you probably would like to lock the palette so the palette won't jump around on every frame. And depending on what kind of anim you're creating, you'll add loop frames or not. Or if you're sticking with 24-bit, you can just take those, those two items off. These two boxes that you can check are delete source and wait for source. Delete source 
means that uh, you're going to delete the originals. You're going to delete whatever is in main. It'll load it, create, create whatever, and then just get rid of it. There's also wait for source, which means that imp can sit around in the background. And let's say you've created an Aladdin 4D sequence of some sort, and you want to run everything through image effects to have some kind of special effect happening. Well, wait for source can just sit there, and it'll grab the frames as they're rendered, and then run them through image effects based on whatever you put here in the proc string. And the proc string is where all the magic happens. Proc is short for process. And so there's a specific pattern that we follow that we, of stuff that we put in the proc string, and it's this. Rx, then a space, then the path of the script, which is the macro that you created, then the name of the macro itself, and then dollar sign parentheses, the start value of the variable that you want to change, and then comma, and the end value, and the parentheses. This is outlined in page 41 of the uh, image effects 2.6 addendum. Now in our particular case, our proc line is going to look like this. It's going to be rx, image effects colon, dot, uh, image effects colon rex, that's where it's located, that's the volume and the directory. Then the slash and swirl demo dot ifx. And then dollar sign parentheses negative 40, positive 40. So let's type that in. Rx slash You'll note that uh, we called it swirl macro. That's just to make it clearer and hit return. Now what's going to happen is as the, as the 30 frames go by, the first frame, it'll feed negative 40 to that x, to that x value that we established. And it'll do that, it'll, it'll keep feeding different numbers all the way through to 30, which is the last frame. And that'll be positive 40 degrees. And that's what'll get the swirl to actually move over time. And you don't have to do any other work than this. There's no math for you to do or anything. So once you have that done, you just hit begin, and we're happily rendering. Now once you have these rendered out, we rendered out a few sample frames for you to look at. Um, and these will show you how the, how the effect changes gradually. Like here's frame number one, which is a swirl of negative 40. As we move closer and closer to the middle of the sequence, which would be around frame 15, right, that's halfway between 1 and 30, you're going to see that we get closer and closer to 0. And then we're going to grow back up to 40 until she's twisted the entirely different direction. So you've seen how easy it is to get these effects to animate, to change, to evolve over time. Now this isn't limited to just swirl. Pretty much anything in image effects that you can macro record, anything that has a percentage of strength can change. A good example would be in the distort menu, you have uh, warp, which does the pinch and the punch effect. That is a strength percentage that you could vary over time. So you can see that you can take image effects and make it into a radical special effects machine just by changing one or two numbers. Ever since Nova Design put a lightning bolt on the front of the manual of image effects, this has become one of the hottest effects to create on the Amiga. However, animating the effect has been kind of difficult and out of the reach of image effects users around. And fairly recently, I was able to crack the code to make this possible for you. The great news is it's using the technique that we just covered, that of taking a variable and changing it over time when applying it to a sequence of frames. The thing is, instead of animating just one variable, we'll be changing four. But like I say, it's no big deal. It should be pretty simple. So let's take a look. First, let's load up the picture. I'm sure you're glad to see something other than the, uh, than the old lady we've been looking at. So here's our background, kind of a, a moody, stormy looking piece. Let's hit Effect and lightning. Now there are 
plenty of parameters here to play with. Uh, there's the overall bolt size, thickness. There's all kinds of controls for glow, the branches, the number of branches, random seeds. What we're most interested in are these coordinate parameters and also this random seed, which kind of controls everything. Now, the random seed is, is just that. It's a random number. And from this, lightning generates more random numbers. Because we're trying to capture the essence of a natural phenomena, it needs a certain amount of randomness so that the zigzagging looks, looks fairly natural. Below this, we've got the starting and ending points. Now, lightning has a start point and an end point. And here it's expressed as uh, x, y, and z starting, and then x, y, and z ending. Because lightning is more or less like a line, you know, that's pointing someplace. Let me show you over here what I mean. Is we've got the lightning, and this is what we're going to be creating. Now, the distance this way on your TV, this is x-axis, right? And then up and down is the y-axis. The z-axis is, is what comes out towards you. Now, on television, of course, you know, the depth is just an illusion. You know, there's nothing actually coming out at you on television. Um, so things that are far away look small, and things that are close look really big. Now, the way it works with lightning is when you have a small z value, it gets kind of tiny. Like here at the top, it's, it's pointy looking. Whereas as we get down to the bottom, this is the end point, and this is big and fat. So what we're going to be doing in our animation is when we start out rendering these, uh, these lightning bolts, the start and the end point are going to be at the same place. It's just going to be a little dot. And as the animation goes on, the end point will keep stretching down the bottom until it hits the ground, its ultimate destination down here. So let's take a look and see what, what we have to change in the interface itself. OK, what I'd like you to do is to load up the demo lightning file. This was included in the disk that came with Catalyzer. This will give you the same values that I'm using. You'll note the starting points are at x, y, and z. 565, 2, and 10, and we're ending at 377, 398, 120. You'll want to jot these numbers down. We're going to be needing them later. And here again, the random seed is at 1591. So jot that down someplace as well. And let's hit OK and see what this is going to look like. Ah, you, you get kind of a feeling of what it'll look like as it strikes. This is pretty cool. So this is what our animation would look like at frame 30, you know, because our lightning has hit the ground. The squiggling might be a little bit different because of that randomness that I talked about earlier. So let's record the macro now. I'm going to go back and hit undo. So let's hit shift and one. And we'll call this file demo lightning. Hit return. Sure, we can overwrite it. We won't record the current draw settings. Hit Effect, Lightning. And if you haven't already loaded the demo lightning file, now's a good time. And then hit OK. And this is all being recorded into that macro text file that we'll be editing in just a few minutes. OK, there it is. Once it finishes redrawing, hit Shift and 2 to close off the macro. If you wanted to, this would be a good point at which to test the macro to see how it was recorded by using the AREX button and then finding Demo Lightning. However, we're going to move on. Uh, if you want to use the image that we've included with Catalyzer for this, you're going to need to use that same auto effects trick that we talked about in the previous segment to rename one frame for a whole sequence. So it'll load up this frame and make 30 identical copies. Or if you want to add a more cinematic quality to the lightning that we'll be creating, you could take 30 frames of video grabs or uh, something you've rendered, something that's a sequence. Okay? But the sequence is what's important, because IMP only reads sequences. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's actually go to IMP right now by hitting hook. Actually, before we do that, let's go check out the macro. So I'm going to hit left Amiga M. And you'll notice we're already at uh, image effects slash rex. So let's go ed.
demo lightning.ifx. Okay. So remember what our steps were from before. First, we write out parse arg. And I said at the top of this segment that we were going to be manipulating four of these variables. So we go x space, y space, z space, because we're, this is the end point, And we're going to be moving its x, y, and z coordinates. And then s for the seed. This is to change the squiggliness of the lightning as it's taking place. Now there's something that we haven't worked with before. Notice that there's a, a quote right there in front of set env. That means that we're going to have to enclose some parts of this macro in quotes to make sure they work correctly. Well, note, here we go. We've got 5, 65, 2, and 10. Those are the start points, if you'll remember. And then 377, 398, and 120 were the end points. These are what we want to delete. So first, let's put the close quotes after the 10. Delete these three variables and type x space, y space, z. And then make sure to have those quotes come back on for this number, 3.213, etc. Let's zap to the end of the line by hitting chef, shift and the right, amiga key, uh, the right arrow key. Now the seed value is the seventh from the end. It's 1591. So again, we're going to put quotes on the last number, which is 45. Quotes in front of 16,506 and just drop an S in there. And this is going to be where we vary the seed, the random seed, over the course of the animation. So let's save this to disk. And there, our macro is done. So left Amiga M to go back to image effects and hit hook and imp. And here it is. Now we've, we've looked at imp before and we've noted the similarities with auto effects. So the first thing we do is we want to load up our background in main. Now I've already generated 30 identical copies of that storm picture included on the floppy disk. And I have it uh, in the catalyzer drive. And I've got it called background. VKG is short for background. Remember to take off those last five numbers, leaving only the period. Then let's go into destination. This is where everything will get saved. So I'm going to have this save onto catalyzer colon rf and we'll call it lightning dot and again don't put any numbers there so 1 to 30 that's just fine we're generating a 30 frame sequence as we said before instead of rendering an animation let's uh, click on this bar a few times until we're saving 24 bit frames and then take off lock palette and adding loop frames so here comes our proc string, and the process is the same as before. Rx space, and then the path, which is image effects rex slash, and then the name of the macro, which is demo lightning, and remember that uh, period. Remember that image effects adds a dot ifx after macros that you create. Then start doing the dollar sign parentheses pattern that we had earlier. So this first one is the x value. So we want it to start at 565 and end up at 377. These are the start and end points of the x, of the uh, x part of the lightning. This means that you know these, these values change, and that's what's going to make the lightning grow. Then the second one would be 2, comma 398. After that, dollar sign parentheses, 10, comma, 120. Now, we're not quite done yet. We've got the x, y, and z values uh, varying nicely. But we have to add that seed, don't forget. So we started out with 1591, and then just pick some other number, some other four-digit number. And it's important to make sure that that number is as long as your original seed number. We used a four-digit number for the original seed. Make sure that the second one is the same. Hit return, and just for safety, we'll save the project. And we'll call it uh, demo 
lightning. And it'll add the dot imp by its own. That's it. We're ready to roll. All we do is hit begin and kick back and just let it render. I've loaded up just a few frames of this animation so you can take a look and see you know, how you should be coming along. This is frame 7, so you can see where the lightning is kind of small and in the upper corner. And here comes frame 13, and you can see where it's changing and it's a little bit longer. Here's frame 25, which will actually be almost all the way down to the ground. And finally, frame 30, showing you the finished product. There's a few things to remember about lightning. One is to use it kind of sparingly. If you're trying to recreate nature, well, lightning is a very momentary phenomenon, right? It just hits, it flashes, that's it. What we're creating is more like special effects type lightning, which is cool on its own. And it doesn't have to be just lightning. This could be laser beams, or you could have the, the Jacob's Ladder, like in old horror movies, with the spark crawling up the two bars, or, uh, or maybe it's some kind of funky laser gun. Uh, explore lightning a little bit more. The, one of the cool things, once you've got this under your belt, uh, in lightning you could have multiple segments. So you could actually create logos out of lightning, or have a circle or a ball of lightning. And all of this comes from just animating just a few variables. So I really hope that you get a kick out of this technique. This video has been the catalyst for getting your ideas from the brain box out onto the screen in a short amount of time, and we hope you enjoyed it. Check out other upcoming volumes of Catalyzer for more image effects tips and more creative fun. I'll see you there. Right on.